it's okay. I actually don't have any secret notes to share, so I'm I'm happy with this. If you guys are fine, and you also know the, or you know, yeah, but you're the mouse there. The mouse, so is, I have the mouse the full, is over here. I have the full screen view on my private laptop, and you get the public. Oh, it's me. Okay, great. Okay, great. Uh, no, I, keep I'm going, trying. Keep to going. Try. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. That's, that makes all the difference, whether we have a public view or a private view. Hopefully, towards the second half of your talk, you would appreciate some of that differentiation, too. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think Constantine has mentioned I've um, collaborated for, with and sort of interacted with actually uh, many of the faculty members here at WNCG for, for over uh, several years. I'm also locally based in Austin, although I work remotely with a team and, in the uh, enterprise networking uh, business unit. Um, we call ourselves Innovation Labs. We're a small team. So today, um, I'm happy to present some of the work we have been sort of dabbling with in the space of machine learning and AI, but hopefully from a slightly different perspective. And uh, this work is jointly with several of my actually senior colleagues and, and all from the same uh, lab. And I'm, I'll be mostly focusing on trying to paint a different picture on how to extend today's machine learning from a purely centralized cloud-centric, uh, you know, sort of uh, deploy um, architecture to a more broad, multi-site, geographically distributed um, architecture. And hopefully that can enable new types of applications and, and many of them with potential um, networking impl implementations. So with that, if we review um, some of the, let's say, the most um, typical applications um, today people use on a daily basis, the type of um, machine learning is really being carried out by the user devices uh, uploading their data and you know, training data is being gathered to be collected in the cloud and to facilitate centralized training. And once enough, enough amount of training samples are gathered and trained over time, a sophisticated machine learning model can be um, learned. And, and either you can offer that as an AI as a service to answer queries and additional sort of uh, query samples for inference. So in that case, both the training and the inference run in the cloud. Or in certain scenarios, um, some of the uh, today's applications also support local inference. So a lightweight model will be deployed back to the device. For instance, today's Android phones, uh, iPhones, or support uh, you know, sort of embedded neural networks. So you can run local inference. But even if you look at the case with local inference, for both of these um, architectures, the cloud is heavily involved in sort of is in in charge of centralized training of the, um, of the model, and it, sort of, it, it has the uh, um, view of all the training and data submitted to it. So with that, uh, some of the main challenges involve uh, privacy and security concerns. That probably goes without saying many of the um, enterprise use cases, they simply are not very comfortable submitting their data to be processed elsewhere. And with some of the mo more recent, you know, um, sort of highly publicized uh, um, uh, news, uh, you know, sort of privacy-related news, and some of us are also getting slightly concerned about uploading our, you know, uh, sharing our images uh, via cloud-based service providers. So, so the other aspect, a potential challenge, is that to support the training of some large-scale uh, machine learning models, and typically you do need to gather a massive data upstream. This might be fine if it's just audio samples or even a collection of images, but once we get to the stage of if you want to do something that's training on uh, streaming of video, then the bandwidth requirement can quickly grow out of hand and become uh, simply infeasible. If we're thinking about, let's say, multi-site surveillance camera type of uh, um, applications. So basically, we want to be, um, we want to be able to support um, machine sort of uh, training, cloud-based training, but with lim w but over bandwidth constraint connections instead. And finally, um, for cases where uh, we're running the cloud-based inference, this may not be suitable for some of the uh, latency-sensitive applications. Of course, if we can support local inference, that problem can be solved separately. So these are some of the criticisms or challenges in a uh, 
uh, you know, centralized cloud-centric type of machine learning architecture. Um, we instead are starting to consider, um, I wouldn't say an alternative architecture, but rather a augmented, you know, version of the architecture where we can provide some of the leverage, some of the intelligence deployed at the edge to augment um, cloud-based machine learning. So in this architecture, if we're considering each of the um, you know, geographically distributed sites, uh, having, um, having access to locally observed data, instead of you know, blindly transmitting all the data, up, upstreaming them to the cloud for centralized learning, maybe we can do some intelligent processing so, and then only transmit, selectively transmit a subset of the data to the cloud while still facilitating centralized training. An alternative is instead of transmitting the data, we might uh, want to transmit uh, a model of a locally trained model. Here I'm using a different color just to show that the model potentially could be an either uh, you know, a smaller version of the uh, um, discriminative type of machine learning uh, model that the, the cloud is trying to learn. For instance, Google has some very nice interesting work on federated learning, which is um, basically um, supported by the exchange of machine learning models between um, multiple contributors versus a, a cloud-based uh, global version of the model. Or alternatively, some of our own work are considering the use of locally trained generative models. We can think of them as maybe a, a quick example would be um, some of the new versions of uh, generative adversarial networks, which are very good at generating highly realistic synthetic um, images and samples. So we think of those generative models as an alternative way of of packing or you know compressing the um, information uh, the high dimensional sort of uh, statistical characteristics of the information learned locally so instead of transmitting the data itself we may alternatively transmit those locally trained generative models to the cloud or and in some other cases may, maybe transmit synthetic data uh, generated using those um, you know sort of locally trained models so in that case we can leverage the edge sites for not only local inference but also local training and with that of course for many of the applications the centrally trained global model will still be deployed back to the edge sites to support local inference that's where the model is being deployed and sort of uh, exercised on a daily basis so with this um, augmented architecture we feel that it can solve the problem of bandwidth efficient training in a more you know efficient way and at the same time it can naturally support continuous learning I didn't put it up on the slide but it just occurred to me that the third potential benefit is that if we were transmitting not the original data samples but the samples after either processing or you know uh, in the form of locally trained model parameters that give us the opportunity to provide stronger privacy protection as well but the key challenge we want to address is we want to tackle is if we since we're no longer sending everything up to the cloud how can we still preserve um, basically how can we still support the training of a centralized model to aggregate the learning across multiple sites and hopefully you know achieve performance as good as if we were sending everything that so we really, for these type of architectures, we really have a predefined upper bound of performance we can um, try to strive for. Um, so this is kind of the overall architecture. Um, going forward, I wanted to share several pieces, um, actually two pieces of uh, our work exploring uh, this architecture, trying to understand what it can do. So um, we first explored um, about leveraging a local um, inference model to use that to do intelligent training sample selection. So instead of upstreaming all the locally observed um, training data, we show a way to leverage a copy of the global model to do an intelligent sample selection and only send an effective subset of the model so we can do more bandwidth efficient training. The second piece of work uh, is on 
learning with local generative models, we, we actually showed in, in fairly recent work that if we, if we have a critical mass of local data and we can successfully train a local generative model using GAN, for instance, and combine that with a few, uh, you know, a few actually just random original data samples, the combination of that uh, aggregated across multiple sites can actually um, effectively support the centralized training where the global model is trained in a semi-supervised manner using both unlabeled uh, generated synthetic samples as well as um, labeled original samples. The third um, piece of work that I'm going to share today is on privacy preserving learning. This is the scheme where I was mentioning in the very beginning in the sense that what if we don't really want to um, expose our private view of the data to the, uh, to the, to the pub, to, let's say to a machine learning model hosted in the public domain, what can we do? We, ex we sort of experimented with a method where we instead ship a public view of the data which are synthetic data generated using the generative model. So these are, um, this is kind of an overview of some pieces of work um, the, the small team that I mentioned have been uh, working on. Today, um, due to time constraints, I'm going to drop the middle. Uh, but hopefully the other two you know, sort of pieces of work show both the merits of leveraging um, the global model in local um, inf inference, as well as the merit of having a locally trained generative model. The middle one uh, is actually my personal favorite, but I'll be happy to uh, chat about it. It's just that I don't want to run over time and you know, uh, get into the coffee break period either. And also, uh, I know this, um, this sort of a symposium is mostly for wireless networks, and of course, uh, most of these architecture designs were, in, were motivated mostly by the opportunity of um, applying machine learning over you know, wireless network telemetry data, for instance. But of course, somebody in the uh, audience mentioned earlier today that we don't yet have the image net for wireless data yet. So, so far for just experimenting with, you know, exploring the merits of the architecture itself. With, for the rest of this talk, um, most of the machine learning results I'm showing are operated over standard um, image data set ranging from handwritten digits, you know, the hollow word of uh, machine learning uh, image recognition, all the way to some of the facial recognition, uh, you know, sort of uh, facial image data, large scale facial image data sets. So, um, so let's maybe get a little bit in depth onto the first scheme that I mentioned. It's for a training sample selection. So architecture, architecturally what we consider is that each of the edge sites have basically naturally have access to uh, some of its locally observed samples. We're considering, so in initially it does have access to all the, the, the entire set of all the local uh, training samples. And then um, because of the application, many of the applications already host a, um, a host a local copy of the global model for deployment. Typically running inference also requires significantly less computation compared to being able to train. So, um, so that is um, typically um, feasible for many of the applications too. So we're going to leverage this uh, model which can be run for inference to use that as our basically use that as our filtering mechanism and come up with a way to screen out the locally observed training samples and only select a subset of them to support the global training. That's kind of the, that's, that's how we're going to play the game. And as you can see with this um, paradigm, uh, as I already mentioned, it leverages local inference of a global model. It supports centralized training of the global model. And also it naturally supports the continuous learning and updates. Maybe at day one, when there is not a global model, we do have to submit everything you know, observed on day one to facilitate the training of a course version of the model. But once this global model is being deployed, deployed uh, over to each of the edge sites, it can be leveraged so that the additional sample selections can be selected to incrementally improve the performance of the model. We're going to show some of that in our simulation as well. So with this uh, architecture in mind, the key piece, of course, is how are we going to choose which samples to keep, which samples to transmit. So if we look into 
um, kind of a, um, a slightly generalized version, right, of many of the, uh, let's say, classification-based uh, machine learning models. Here, if we take a training sample in and run it through inference, for instance, for, for all the image image-related work we do, there is a convolutional neural network. The last two layers shows the sort of the, the last softmax layer typically shows a per class probability that the model tries to predict the input uh, training sample. And of course, given the training sample, we also know the ground truth. So by observing uh, the combination of these two, um, we know two things. First, we know that for this specific training sample, whether the model made a correct or incorrect prediction, because we're running it on inference, and we also know the ground truth. So that's a binary, you know, one bit of information we can leverage. The second information is that typically the per class probability, the, the shape of that distribution is an indication of how confident, uh, for lack of a better word, how confident the model is making that prediction. So we're going to try to leverage that. In so intuitively, we feel that it's not only you know, right and wrong, it's just the binary information, right? So if we use that to do our training sample selection, um, there's not really much room for, um, for optimization. So intuitively, we feel that how confident the model you know, sort of uh, and generates its decision can also feed to whether that training sample is informative to the training process or not. So we're going to try to capture that with some kind of confidence score, and also we're going to experimentally decide whether it's worthwhile to select our training samples based on confidence. Intuitively, of course, we feel that unconfident samples may, uh, once you run it through the training process, may help the model improve more. And also, intuitively, if the model made a mistake on a given training sample, that's an informative training sample that we want to preserve. So, given that in mind, as I mentioned, these two questions on how to compute the confidence score and how to select you know, our training samples based on either confidence or correctness or both, we're going to explore that part a little bit more empirically, running some experiments for lack of a, for lack of a theoretical, you know, analysis uh, method. So, um, so what we tried is first off, for the choice of confidence scores, we just came up with a few different ways of um, more like different uh, forms of equations to map the probability distribution, which is vector, to some, uh, to some uh, confidence score. So intuitively, for instance, you can consider, you can easily measure the entropy of, a, of any given probability distribution. So there already you have one uh, confidence score, or you can also combine that information with the binary, you know, um, the, the ground truth label to calculate the soft version of the cross entropy, that's, that's actually naturally the loss function the uh, neural network uses for, train, for updating its uh, model parameter. The other two methods we tried were uh, Gini, Gini Simpson index. It's, it's more used in the economic sense, trying to measure how equally distributed those uh, pr probability values are, as well as maximum likelihood, just trying to compare the highest uh, probability value versus the second to last. All these are some uh, heuristic ways of measuring how spread out the probability is as an indication of how confident the model is. And what we showed is that, um, interestingly, the specific choice of how we calculate those, you know, um, probability distribution, like the peakiness of the probability distribution, does not matter that much. At the end of the day, what really matters is that um, by ranking all the training samples based on their confidence score, we do have a slight gain compared to the pink curve there where we're simply choosing the training samples based on correctness or not. So the, the main lesson we learned is that it is important to incorporate that information because now you have a real value to rank all your numbers on, not just the binary, uh, binary sort of uh, tag for individual samples, and that does give you slight performance gain without loss. And then for the rest of our simulations, since the specific choice of those equations don't matter that much in this specific case, we stick with a cross entropy, just because it naturally corresponds to the loss function of the uh, neural network calculation. 
So with that, if I were to summarize our training sample selection policy, uh, stepping back, it's actually very intuitive. Basically, we start out by for any given training sample, once we run the inference, we automatically can get its confidence score as well as its correctness value. So we have the input to our selection, and then we first prioritize the transmission of all the incorrect samples first. And typically, our models are already quite good. We're looking at accuracy on the order of 95% and above, especially for the MNIST data set. So that's, that's typically a very small fraction. Like all the, in, even if you transmit all the incorrect samples, that's a very small fraction of all the training samples we're looking at. And then for the rest of the uh, correct samples, we will pro prioritize transmitting the ones that are, um, that are measured uh, as uh, inconfident. So, Visually, basically, the sequence of you know how we how we go through the uh, the collection of training samples go like this. I made a gross simplification here because obviously confidence versus non-confident it's not a binary choice. As I mentioned before, it's everything is ranked per score. So um, with this, um, go ahead. Sorry. Two minutes left for the talk. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so um, with, uh, with this, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, policy in mind, and if, we're, if we're comparing the blue curve, which incorporates the policy that I just mentioned, versus uh, either a confidence oblivious score, uh, a confidence oblivious uh, selection scheme, or one that, um, you know, sort of uh, the black one that just simply does random sampling, we do see an improvement in, oops, sorry. We do see an improvement in terms of uh, improving the, uh, the final uh, classification accuracy of the model. And at the same time, uh, another benefit is that it actually accelerates training because now the model can improve faster with less number of uh, samples. The, the horizontal axis shows how our model improves over time with each round of iteration of you know, deploying back the global model and then sending additional um, training samples and improving it again. Another view of this is that uh, if we compare the performance of the model when we're limiting our transmitting to only 1% of all the observed tra uh, training sample versus 15%, so those are in black and blue, uh, sorry, so, um, so those are in dotted and uh, solid lines respectively and compare the two schemes, random sampling versus the, uh, our intelligent selection scheme, we can see that interestingly, if we select our samples very carefully, leveraging the inference calculation, we can do almost as well, uh, you know, using only by selecting only 1% of the samples compared to in uniform sampling and uh, using 15%. Uh, so for this, you can sort of make the statement to say that you can more or less gain a 15, per, you know, sort of 15x bandwidth reduction for the specific data set, right, sort of um, by doing sample selection. So I was told that I'm kind of running out of time very soon, so I probably won't have time to get into the details of this uh, second piece of the talk, which is trying to leverage a generative model to support, again, uh, centralized training. Um, so this is a generic picture, just shows that we can train a local generative model and use the synthetic label samples to, to, um, to train a global model, typically for a discriminative type of task. For the specific work that we do, we are mostly interested in exploring, investigating the trade-off between learnability, how much this leverage of synthetic label samples degrade the learning performance compared to using original samples versus uh, you know, the privacy pre preservation. Um, and this is a more detailed picture just showing how we apply this to the, um, you know, the the data set of facial images and show that once we train a generative model, you know, we can sort of support the training of a global discriminative model. I don't think I have detailed, uh, you know, sort of uh, sufficient time to go over the details of the performance, but just maybe um, the general learning is that if we're comparing the blue versus the, the green, these are the, uh, um, the classification accuracy of the model performance on the test data set, which are all original data. So here, we're basically trying to show is that even if the model is trained using synthetically generated data, its performance on the original test data set is still fairly high. So that's a viable approach in terms of preserving learnability. Of course, the performance gap 
kind of varies depending on the data set and the task we're trying to, to run on these uh, facial images. And these two uh, slides I'm going to gloss over really quickly. They are a way for us to measure how well the model preserves privacy by trying to compare the faces um, we have synthetically generated versus and then running a query against the existing data set. Our premise is, uh, our hypothesis is that if we don't query out any image that look very close to our synthetic image, then that's an indication of, you know, our synthetic images are preserving the individual, you know, uniqueness of the, the faces. And um, just because, you know, facial query of a facial um, image um, distance that itself is open re research. We sort of run the same experiment over two different sets of uh, facial image uh, distance metrics. So with that, uh, I'll just briefly summarize. So basically these two set of uh, schemes that I mentioned, and the third one that I didn't even have time to get into showed some of the promise of augmenting a cloud-based uh, training with edge-based computing. And either by leveraging a local inference model or by performing sort of even more computation locally trained uh, generative models. And uh, of course, to loop back to applications to wireless, currently uh, we are, so these are all kind of the preludes to the really exciting work we are working on right now that is trying to apply some of the methods that we have learned to a collection of uh, wireless related applications, all the way from optimizing the you know, wireless networking performance for the next generation Wi-Fi network, also uh, in you know, sort of improving indoor localization uh, services, which is an existing service already, as well as exploring new applications using RF-based uh, you know, sort of, uh, behavior analytics and anomaly detection, considering CSI measurements, you know, channel state information as the new, new type of data that we can feed our machine learning algorithms on. So um, with that, uh, thanks again for, to the audience, and I'm not sure if I have time for questions. your data, yes. you may actually compress your data rather than uh, feeding in the model. You may send compressed data. So has there been any comparison between comparing those two approaches? Oh, uh, uh, we have not because our notion is that if you compress, let's say, the original uh, four set of training data, you can, whatever compression scheme you use, you can also use it on the subset of training sample you select. Yeah, so we consider, basically, you can reduce the bandwidth further by applying off-the-shelf compression. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um.